This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Robin Cotter, Toronto, Ontario, October 2006. The Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 50 Chat Between Brother and Sister. During the time which Lord de Winter took to shut the door, close a shutter, and draw a chair near to his sister in law's fauteuil, Milady, anxiously thoughtful, plunged her glance into the depths of possibility, and discovered all the plan, of which she could not even obtain a glance, as long as she was ignorant into whose hands she had fallen. She knew her brother-in-law to be a worthy gentleman, a bold hunter, an intrepid player, enterprising with women, but by no means remarkable for his skill in intrigues. How had he discovered her arrival, and caused her to be seized? Why did he detain her? Athos had dropped some words which proved that the conversation she had with the cardinal had fallen into outside ears, but she could not suppose that he had dug a countermine so promptly and so boldly. She rather feared that her preceding operations in England might have been discovered. Buckingham might have guessed that it was she who had cut off the two studs, and avenge himself for that little treachery. But Buckingham was incapable of going to any excess against a woman, particularly if that woman was supposed to have acted from a feeling of jealousy. This supposition appeared to her most reasonable. It seemed to her that they wanted to revenge the past, and not to anticipate the future. At all events, she congratulated herself upon having fallen into the hands of her brother-in-law, with whom she reckoned she could deal very easily, rather than into the hands of an acknowledged and intelligent enemy. "'Yes, let us chat, brother,' said she, with a kind of cheerfulness, decided as she was to draw from the conversation, in spite of all the dissimulation Lord de Winter could bring." the revelations of which she stood in need to regulate her future conduct. "'You have, then, decided to come to England again,' said Lord de Winter, "'in spite of the resolutions you so often expressed in Paris, never to set your feet on British ground?' Milady replied to this question by another question. "'To begin with, tell me,' said she, "'how have you watched me so closely?' as to be aware beforehand, not only of my arrival, but even of the day, the hour, and the port at which I should arrive? Lord de Winter adopted the same tactics as Milady, thinking that, as his sister-in-law employed them, they must be the best. "'But tell me, my dear sister,' replied he, "'what makes you come to England?' "'I come to see you,' replied Milady, without knowing how much— she aggravated by this reply the suspicions to which D'Artagnan's letter had given birth in the mind of her brother-in-law, and only desiring to gain the good will of her auditor by a falsehood. "'Ah, to see me?' said de Winter cunningly. "'To be sure to see you. What is there astonishing in that? And you had no other object in coming to England but to see me?' "'No,' "'So it was for me alone you have taken the trouble to cross the channel?' "'The deuce! What tenderness, my sister! "'But am I not your nearest relative?' demanded Milady, with a tone of the most touching ingenuousness. "'And my only heir, are you not?' said Lord de Winter in his turn, fixing his eyes on those of Milady. Whatever command she had over herself, Milady could not help starting— and as in pronouncing the last words Lord de Winter placed his hand upon the arm of his sister, this start did not escape him. In fact, the blow was direct and severe. The first idea that occurred to Milady's mind was that she had been betrayed by Kitty, 
and that she had recounted to the baron the selfish aversion toward himself, of which she had imprudently allowed some marks to escape before her servant. She also recollected the furious and imprudent attack she had made upon D'Artagnan, when he spared the life of her brother. "'I do not understand, my lord,' said she, in order to gain time and make her adversary speak out. "'What do you mean to say? Is there any secret meeting concealed beneath your words?' "'Oh, my God, no!' said Lord de Winter, with apparent good nature. "'You wish to see me, and you come to England. I learn this desire, or rather I suspect that you feel it, and in order to spare you all the annoyances of a nocturnal arrival in a port, and all the fatigues of landing, I send one of my officers to meet you. I place a carriage at his orders, and he brings you hither to this castle, of which I am governor, whither I come every day, and where, in order to satisfy our mutual desire of seeing each other, I have prepared you a chamber." What is there more astonishing in all that I have said to you than in what you have told me? No, what I think astonishing is that you should expect my coming. And yet that is the most simple thing in the world, my dear sister. Have you not observed that the captain of your little vessel, on entering the roadstead, sent forward, in order to obtain permission to enter the port, a little boat bearing his log-book and the register of his voyagers? I am commandant of the port. They brought me that book. I recognized your name in it. My heart told me what your mouth has just confirmed, that is to say, with what view you have exposed yourself to the dangers of a sea so perilous, or at least so troublesome at this moment, and I sent my cutter to meet you. You know the rest. Milady knew that Lord de Winter lied, and she was the more alarmed. My brother, continued she, was not that my lord Buckingham, whom I saw on the jetty this evening when we arrived? Himself. Ah, I can understand how the sight of him struck you, replied Lord de Winter. You came from a country where he must be very much talked of, and I know that his armaments against France greatly engage the attention of your friend the cardinal. My friend the cardinal? cried Milady. Seeing that on this point, as in the other, Lord de Winter seemed well instructed. "'Is he not your friend?' replied the baron negligently. "'Ah, pardon, I thought so. But we will return to my Lord Duke presently. Let us not depart from the sentimental turn our conversation has taken. You came, you say, to see me?' "'Yes. Well, I reply that you shall be served to the height of your wishes— and that we shall see each other every day. "'Am I, then, to remain here eternally?' demanded Milady, with a certain terror. "'Do you find yourself badly lodged, sister? Demand anything you want, and I will hasten to have you furnished with it. But I have neither my women nor my servants.' "'You shall have all, madame. Tell me on what footing your household was established by your first husband.' and although I am only your brother-in-law, I will arrange one similar. "'My first husband!' cried Milady, looking at Lord de Winter with eyes almost starting from their sockets. "'Yes, your French husband. I don't speak of my brother. If you have forgotten, as he is still living, I can write to him, and he will send me information on the subject.' A cold sweat burst from the brow of Milady. "'You jest!' said she, in a hollow voice. "'Do I look so?' asked the baron, rising and going a step backward. "'Or rather you insult me,' continued she, pressing with her stiffened hands the two arms of her easy chair, and raising herself upon her wrists. "'I insult you,' said Lord de Winter, with contempt. "'In truth, madame, do you think that can be possible?' "'Indeed, sir,' said Milady. "'You must be either drunk or mad. "'Leave the room and send me a woman. "'Women are very indiscreet, my sister. "'Cannot I serve you as a waiting-maid? "'By that means all our secrets will remain in the family.' "'Insolent!' cried Milady, 
as if acted upon by a spring, she bounded toward the baron, who awaited her attack with his arms crossed, but nevertheless with one hand on the hilt of his sword. Come, said he, I know you are accustomed to assassinate people, but I warn you I shall defend myself, even against you. You are right, said Milady. You have all the appearance of being cowardly enough to lift your hand against a woman. Perhaps so, and I have an excuse, for mine would not be the first hand of a man that has been placed upon you, I imagine. And the baron pointed, with a slow and accusing gesture, to the left shoulder of Milady, which he almost touched with his finger. Milady uttered a deep, inward shriek, and retreated to a corner of the room like a panther which crouches for a spring. "'Oh, growl as much as you please,' cried Lord de Winter, "'but don't try to bite, for I warn you that it would be to your disadvantage. There are here no procurators who regulate successions beforehand. There is no knight-errant to come and seek a quarrel with me on account of the fair lady I detain a prisoner.' but I have judges quite ready who will quickly dispose of a woman so shameless as to glide, a bigamist into the bed of Lord de Winter, my brother. And these judges, I warn you, will soon send you to an executioner, who will make both your shoulders alike. The eyes of Milady darted such flashes that although he was a man and armed before an unarmed woman, he felt the chill of fear glide through his whole frame. However, he continued all the same, but with increasing warmth. Yes, I can very well understand that after having inherited the fortune of my brother, it would be very agreeable to you to be my heir likewise. But know beforehand, if you kill me, or cause me to be killed, my precautions are taken. Not a penny of what I possess will pass into your hands, were you not already rich enough, you who possess nearly a million? And could you not stop your fatal career, if you did not do evil for the infinite and supreme joy of doing it? Oh, be assured, if the memory of my brother were not sacred to me, you should rot in a state dungeon, or satisfy the curiosity of sailors at Tyburn. I will be silent, but you must endure your captivity quietly." In fifteen or twenty days I shall set out for La Rochelle with the army. But on the eve of my departure, a vessel which I shall see depart will take you hence, and convey you to our colonies in the south, and be assured that you shall be accompanied by one who will blow your brains out at the first attempt you make to return to England or the continent." Milady listened with an attention that dilated her inflamed eyes. "'Yes, at present,' continued Lord de Winter, "'you will remain in this castle. The walls are thick, the doors strong, and the bars solid. Besides, your window opens immediately over the sea. The men of my crew, who are devoted to me for life and death, mount guard around this apartment, and watch all the passages that lead to the courtyard.' Even if you gained the yard, there would still be three iron gates for you to pass. The order is positive. A step, a gesture, a word on your part, denoting an effort to escape, and you are to be fired upon. If they kill you, English justice will be under an obligation to me for having saved it trouble. Ah, I see your features regain their calmness. Your countenance recovers its assurance. You are saying to yourself, Fifteen days, twenty days, bah! I have an inventive mind. Before that is expired, some idea will occur to me. I have an infernal spirit. I shall meet with a victim. Before fifteen days are gone by, I shall be away from here. Ah! Try it! Milady, finding her thoughts betrayed, dug her nails into her flesh, to subdue every emotion that might give to her face any expression except agony. Lord de Winter continued, The officer who commands here in my absence you have already seen, and therefore know him. 
He knows how, as you must have observed, to obey an order, for you did not, I am sure, come from Portsmouth hither, without endeavouring to make him speak. What do you say of him? Could a statue of marble have been more impassive and more mute? You have already tried the power of your seductions upon many men, and unfortunately you have always succeeded. But I give you leave to try them upon this one. Pardieu, if you succeed with him, I pronounce you the demon himself. He went toward the door and opened it hastily. Call Mr. Felton, said he. Wait a minute longer, and I will introduce him to you. There followed between these two personages a strange silence, during which the sound of a slow and regular step was heard approaching. Shortly a human form appeared in the shade of the corridor, and the young lieutenant, with whom we are already acquainted, stopped at the threshold to receive the orders of the baron. "'Come in, my dear John,' said Lord de Winter. "'Come in and shut the door.' The young officer entered. "'Now,' said the baron, "'look at this woman. She is young, she is beautiful, she possesses all earthly seductions. Well, she is a monster who, at twenty-five years of age, has been guilty of as many crimes as you could read of in a year in the archives of our tribunals. Her voice prejudices her hearers in her favour. Her beauty serves as a bait to her victims. Her body even pays what she promises. I must do her that justice. She will try to seduce you. Perhaps she will try to kill you. I have extricated you from misery, Felton. I have caused you to be named Lieutenant. I once saved your life. You know on what occasion. I am for you not only a protector, but a friend. Not only a benefactor, but a father. This woman has come back again into England for the purpose of conspiring against my life. I hold this serpent in my hands. Well, I call you and say to you, Friend Felton, John, my child, guard me, and more particularly guard yourself against this woman. Swear by your hopes of salvation to keep her safely for the chastisement she has merited. John Felton, I trust your word. John Felton, I put faith in your loyalty. My lord, said the young officer, summoning to his mild countenance all the hatred he could find in his heart. My lord, I swear all shall be done as you desire. Milady received this look like a resigned victim. It was impossible to imagine a more submissive or a more mild expression than that which prevailed on her beautiful countenance. Lord de Winter himself could scarcely recognize the tigress who a minute before prepared, apparently, for a fight. "'She is not to leave this chamber, understand, John?' continued the baron. "'She is to correspond with nobody. She is to speak to no one but you. If you will do her the honour to address a word to her?' "'That is sufficient, my lord. I have sworn. And now, madame, try to make your peace with God, for you are judged by men.' Milady let her head sink, as if crushed by this sentence. Lord de Winter went out, making a sign to Felton, who followed him, shutting the door after him. One instant after, the heavy step of a marine, who served as sentinel, was heard in the corridor, his axe in his girdle, and his musket on his shoulder. Milady remained for some minutes in the same position, for she thought they might perhaps be examining her through the keyhole. She then slowly raised her head, which had resumed its formidable expression of menace and defiance, ran to the door to listen, looked out of her window, and returning to bury herself again in her large armchair, she reflected. End of chapter 50「The LibriVox Recording」「All LibriVox Recordings are in the public domain」「For more information 
or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Tamara Schwartz. The Three Musketeers by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 51. Officer. Meanwhile, the Cardinal looked anxiously for news from England, but no news arrived that was not annoying and threatening. Although La Rochelle was invested, however certain success might appear, thanks to the precautions taken, and above all to the dike which prevented the entrance of any vessel into the besieged city, the blockade might last a long time yet. This was a great affront to the King's army, and a great inconvenience to the Cardinal, who had no longer, it is true, to embroil Louis the Thirteenth with Anne of Austria, for that affair was over, but he had to adjust matters for Monsieur de Bossombierre, who was embroiled with the Duc d'Anchelon. As to Monsieur, who had begun the siege, he left to the Cardinal the task of finishing it. The city, notwithstanding the incredible perseverance of its mayor, had attempted a sort of mutiny for a surrender. The mayor had hanged the mutineers. This execution quieted the ill-disposed, who resolved to allow themselves to die of hunger, this death always appearing to them more slow and less sure than strangulation. On their side, from time to time, the besiegers took the messengers which the Rochelliers sent to Buckingham, or the spies which Buckingham sent to the Rochelier. In one case or the other the trial was soon over. The cardinal pronounced the single word, HANGED. The king was invited to come and see the hanging. He came languidly, placing himself in a good situation to see all the details. This amused him sometimes a little, and made him endure the siege with patience, but it did not prevent his getting very tired, or from talking at every moment of returning to Paris, so that if the messengers and the spies had failed, his eminence, notwithstanding all his inventiveness, would have found himself much embarrassed. Nevertheless, time passed on, and the Rochelier did not surrender. The last spy that was taken was the bearer of a letter. This letter told Buckingham that the city was at an extremity. But instead of adding, If your succor does not arrive within fifteen days, we will surrender, it added, quite simply, If your succor comes not within fifteen days, we shall all be dead with hunger when it comes. The Rochelier, then, had no hope but in Buckingham. Buckingham was their messiah. It was evident that if they one day learned positively that they must not count on Buckingham, their courage would fail with their hope. The Cardinal looked then with great impatience for the news from England, which would announce to him that Buckingham would not come. The question of carrying the city by assault, though often debated in the council of the King, had been always rejected. In the first place La Rochelle appeared impregnable. Then the Cardinal, whatever he said, very well knew that the horror of bloodshed in this encounter, in which Frenchmen would combat against Frenchmen, was a retrograde movement of sixty years impressed upon his policy, and the Cardinal was at that period what we now call a man of progress. In fact, the sack of La Rochelle, and the assassination of three of four thousand Huguenots, who allowed themselves to be killed, would resemble too closely in 1628 the massacre of St. Bartholomew in 1572, and then, above all this, this extreme measure, which was not at all repugnant to the king, good Catholic as he was, always fell before this argument of the besieging generals, La Rochelle is impregnable, except to famine. The cardinal could not drive from his mind the fear he entertained of his terrible emissary, for he comprehended the strange qualities of this woman, sometimes a serpent, sometimes a lion. Had she betrayed him? Was she dead? He knew her well enough in all cases to know that, whether acting for or against him, as a friend or an enemy, she would not remain motionless without great impediments. But whence did these impediments arise? That was what he could not know. And yet he reckoned, and with reason, on Milady. He had divined in the past of this woman terrible things which his red mantle alone could cover, and he felt, from one cause or another, that this woman was his own as she could look to no other but himself for a support superior to the danger which threatened her. He resolved then to carry on the war alone, and to look for no success foreign to himself, 
but as we look for a fortunate chance. He continued to press the raising of the famous dyke which was to starve La Rochelle. Meanwhile he cast his eyes over that unfortunate city, which contained so much deep misery and so many heroic virtues, and recalling the saying of Louis XI, his political predecessor, as he himself was the predecessor of Robespierre, he repeated this maxim of Tristan's gossip, divide in order to reign. Henry the Fourth, when besieging Paris, had loaves and provisions thrown over the walls. The cardinal had little notes thrown over, in which he represented to the Rochelier how unjust, selfish, and barbarous was the conduct of their leaders. These leaders had corn in abundance, and would not let them partake of it. They adopted as a maxim, for they too had maxims, that it was of very little consequence that women, children, and old men should die, so long as the men who were to defend the walls remained strong and healthy. Up to that time, whether from devotedness or from want of power to act against it, this maxim, without being generally adopted, nevertheless passed from theory into practice. But the notes did it injury. The notes reminded the men that the children, women, and old men, whom they allowed to die, were their sons, their wives, and their fathers, and that it would be more just for every one to be reduced to the common misery in order that equal conditions should give birth to unanimous resolutions. These notes had all the effect that he who wrote them could expect, in that they induced a great number of the inhabitants to open private negotiations with the royal army. But at the moment when the cardinal saw his means already bearing fruit, and applauded himself for having put it in action, an inhabitant of La Rochelle, who had contrived to pass the royal lines, God knows how, such was the watchfulness of Bassompierre, Schomburg, and the Duc d'Angelam, themselves watched over by the cardinal, an inhabitant of La Rochelle, we say, entered the city coming from Portsmouth, and saying that he had seen a magnificent fleet, ready to sail within eight days. Still further, Buckingham announced to the mayor that at length the Great League was about to declare itself against France, and that the kingdom would be at once invaded by the English, imperial, and Spanish armies. This letter was read publicly in all parts of the city. Copies were put up at the corners of the streets, and even they who had begun to open negotiations interrupted them, being resolved to await the succor so pompously announced. This unexpected circumstance brought back Richelieu's former anxiety, and forced him in spite of himself once more to turn his eyes to the other side of the sea. During this time, exempt from the anxiety of its only and true chief, the royal army led a joyous life, neither provisions nor money being wanting in the camp. All the corps rivaled one another in audacity and gaiety. To take spies and hang them, to make hazardous expeditions upon the dike or the sea, to imagine wild plans and to execute them coolly, such were the pastimes which made the army find these days short, which were not only so long to the Rochelier, a prey to famine and anxiety, but even to the cardinal who blockaded them so closely. Sometimes when the cardinal, always on horseback, like the lowest gendarme of the army, cast a pensive glance over those works, so slowly keeping pace with his wishes, which the engineers, brought from all the corners of France, were executing under his orders, if he met a musketeer of the company of Treville, he drew near and looked at him in a peculiar manner, and, not recognizing in him one of our four companions, he turned his penetrating look and profound thoughts in another direction. One day, when oppressed with a mortal weariness of mind, without hope in the negotiations with the city, without news from England, the cardinal went out without any other aim than to be out of doors, and accompanied only by Cahusac and La Houdinière, strolled along the beach. Mingling the immensity of his dreams with the immensity of the ocean, he came, his horse going at a foot's pace, to a hill from the top of which he perceived behind a hedge reclining on the sand and catching in its passage one of those rays of the sun so rare at this period of the year, seven men surrounded by empty bottles. Four of these men were our musketeers, preparing to listen to a letter one of them had just received. This letter was so important that it made them forsake their cards and their dice on the drumhead. The other three were occupied in opening an enormous flagon of Goyacur wine. These were the lackeys of these gentlemen. The cardinal was, as we have said, in very low spirits, 
and nothing when he was in that state of mind increased his depression so much as gaiety in others. Besides, he had another strange fancy, which was always to believe that the causes of his sadness created the gaiety of others. Making a sign to La Houdinière and Cahusac to stop, he alighted from his horse and went toward these suspected merry companions, hoping by means of the sand which deadened the sound of his steps, and of the hedge which concealed his approach, to catch some words of this conversation which appeared so interesting. At ten paces from the hedge he recognized the talkative Gascon, and as he had already perceived that these men were musketeers, he did not doubt that the three others were those called the inseparables, that is to say, Athos, Porthos, and Aramis. It may be supposed that his desire to hear the conversation was augmented by this discovery. His eyes took a strange expression, and with the step of a tiger-cat he advanced toward the hedge. But he had not been able to catch more than a few vague syllables, without any positive sense, when a sonorous and short cry made him start, and attracted the attention of the musketeers. "'Officer!' cried Gourmand. "'You are speaking, you scoundrel!' said Athos, rising upon his elbow and transfixing Grimaud with his flaming look. Grimaud, therefore, added nothing to his speech, but contented himself with pointing his index finger in the direction of the hedge, announcing by this gesture the cardinal and his escort. With a single bound the musketeers were on their feet and saluted with respect. The cardinal seemed furious. "'It appears!' that messieurs the musketeers keep guard," said he. Are the English expected by land, or do the musketeers consider themselves superior officers? Monseigneur, replied Athos, for amid the general fright he alone had preserved the noble calmness and coolness that never forsook him. Monseigneur, the musketeers, when they are not on duty, or when their duty is over, drink and play at dice, and they are certainly superior officers to their lackeys. Lackeys, grumbled the cardinal, lackeys who have the order to warn their masters when any one passes are not lackeys, they are sentinels. Your eminence may perceive that if we had not taken this precaution, we should have been exposed to allowing you to pass without presenting you our respects, or offering you our thanks for the favor you have done us in uniting us. D'Artagnan, continued Athos, you who but lately were so anxious for such an opportunity for expressing your gratitude to Monseigneur, here it is. Avail yourself of it. These words were pronounced with that imperturbable phlegm which distinguished Athos in the hour of danger, and with that excessive politeness which made of him, at certain moments, a king more majestic than kings by birth. D'Artagnan came forward, and stammered out a few words of gratitude, which soon expired under the gloomy looks of the cardinal. "'It does not signify, gentlemen,' continued the cardinal, without appearing to be in the least swerved from his first intention by the diversion which Athos had started. "'It does not signify, gentlemen. I do not like to have simple soldiers, because they have the advantage of serving in a privileged corps, thus to play the great lords. Discipline is the same for them as for everybody else." Athos allowed the cardinal to finish his sentence completely, and bowed in a sign of assent. Then he resumed in his turn, "'Discipline, Monseigneur, has, I hope, in no way been forgotten by us. We are not on duty, and we believe that not being on duty we were at liberty to dispose of our time as we pleased. If we are so fortunate as to have some particular duty to perform for your eminence, we are ready to obey you. Your eminence may perceive," continued Athos, knitting his brow, for this sort of investigation began to annoy him, that we have not come out without our arms. And he showed the cardinal with his finger the four muskets piled near the drum, on which were the cards and dice. "'Your eminence may believe,' added D'Artagnan that we would have come to meet you if we could have supposed it was Monseigneur coming toward us with so few attendants." The cardinal bit his moustache, and even his lips a little. "'Do you know what you look like altogether as you are armed and guarded by your lackeys?' said the cardinal. 
you look like four conspirators. Oh, as to that, Monseigneur, it is true, said Athos. We do conspire, as your eminence might have seen the other morning. Only we conspire against the Rochelais. Ah, you gentlemen of policy, replied the cardinal, knitting his brow in his turn. The secret of many unknown things might perhaps be found in your brains, if we could read them as you read that letter which you concealed as soon as you saw me coming. The color mounted to the face of Athos, and he made a step toward his eminence. One might think you really suspected us, Monseigneur, and we were undergoing a real interrogatory. If it be so, we trust your eminence will deign to explain yourself, and we should then at least be acquainted with our real position. And if it were an interrogatory, replied the cardinal, others besides you have undergone such, Monsieur Athos, and have replied thereto. Thus I have told your eminence that you had but to question us, and we are ready to reply. What was that letter you were about to read, Monsieur Aramis, and which you so promptly concealed? A woman's letter, Monseigneur. Ah, yes, I see, said the cardinal. We must be discreet with this sort of letters, but nevertheless we may show them to a confessor, and you know I have taken orders. Monseigneur, said Athos, with a calmness the more terrible, because he risked his head in making this reply. The letter is a woman's letter, but it is neither signed Marion de Lorme nor Madame de Aguillon. The cardinal became as pale as death. Lightning darted from his eyes. He turned round as if to give an order to Cahusac and Houdinier. Athos saw the movement. He made a step toward the muskets, upon which the other three friends had fixed their eyes, like men ill-disposed to allow themselves to be taken. The cardinalists were three. The musketeers, lackeys included, were seven. He judged that the match would be so much the less equal if Athos and his companions were really plotting, and by one of those rapid turns which he always had at command, all his anger faded away into a smile. "'Well, well,' said he, "'you are brave young men, proud in daylight, faithful in darkness. We can find no fault with you for watching over yourselves when you watch so carefully over others. Gentlemen, I have not forgotten the night in which you served me as an escort to the Red Dovecot. If there were any danger to be apprehended on the road I am going, I would request you to accompany me. But as there is none, remain where you are, finish your bottles, your game, and your letter. Adieu, gentlemen." And, remounting his horse, which Cahusac led to him, he saluted them with his hand and rode away. The four young men, standing and motionless, followed him with their eyes without speaking a single word until he had disappeared. Then they looked at one another. The countenances of all gave evidence of terror, for, notwithstanding the friendly adieu of his eminence, they plainly perceived that the cardinal went away with rage in his heart. Athos alone smiled with a self-possessed, disdainful smile. When the cardinal was out of hearing and sight, "'That Grimond kept bad watch!' cried Porthos, who had a great inclination to vent his ill-humour on somebody. Grimaud was about to reply to excuse himself. Athos lifted his finger, and Grimaud was silent. "'Would you have given up the letter, Aramis?' said D'Artagnan. "'Aye,' said Aramis, in his most flute-like tone. "'I had made up my mind. If he had insisted upon the letter being given up to him, I would have presented the letter to him with one hand, and with the other I would have run my sword through his body. I expected as much, said Athos, and that was why I threw myself between you and him. Indeed, this man is very much to blame for talking thus to other men. One would say he had never had to do with any but women and children. My dear Athos, I admire you. But nevertheless, we were in the wrong, after all. How in the wrong? said Athos. Whose, then, is the air we breathe? Whose is the ocean upon which we look? Whose is the sand upon which we were reclining? Whose is that letter of your mistress? Do these belong to the cardinal? 
Upon my honor, this man fancies the world belongs to him. There you stood, stammering, stupefied, annihilated. One might have supposed the Bastille appeared before you, and that the gigantic Medusa had converted you into stone. Is being in love conspiring? You are in love with a woman whom the Cardinal has caused to be shut up, and you wish to get her out of the hands of the Cardinal. That's a match you are playing with his eminence. This letter is your game. Why should you expose your game to your adversary? That is never done. Let him find it out if he can. We can find out his. Well, that is all very sensible, Athos, said D'Artagnan. In that case, let there be no more question of what's past, and let Aramis resume the letter from his cousin where the cardinal interrupted him. Aramis drew the letter from his pocket. The three friends surrounded him, and the three lackeys grouped themselves again near the wine-jar. "'You had only read a line or two, said D'Artagnan. "'Read the letter again from the commencement.' "'Willingly,' said Aramis. "'My dear cousin, I think I shall make up my mind to set out for Bethune, where my sister has placed our little servant in the convent of the Carmelites. This poor child is quite resigned, as she knows she cannot live elsewhere without the salvation of her soul being in danger. Nevertheless, if the affairs of our family are arranged as we hope they will be, I believe she will run the risk of being damned, and will return to those she regrets, particularly as she knows they are always thinking of her. Meanwhile she is not very wretched. What she most desires is a letter from her intended. I know that such viands pass with difficulty through convent gratings, but after all, as I have given you proofs, my dear cousin, I am not unskilled in such affairs, and I will take charge of the commission. My sister thanks you for your good and eternal remembrance. She has experienced much anxiety, but she is now at length a little reassured, having sent her secretary away, in order that nothing may happen unexpectedly. Adieu, my dear cousin. Tell us of news of yourself as often as you can. That is to say, as often as you can with safety. I embrace you. Marie Michon. Oh, what do I not owe you, Aramis? said D'Artagnan. Dear Constance, I have at length then intelligence of you. She lives, she is in safety in a convent, she is at Bethune. Where is Bethune, Athos? Why, upon the frontiers of Artois and of Flanders. The siege once over, we shall be able to make a tour in that direction. And that will not be long, it is to be hoped, said Porthos for they have this morning hanged a spy who confessed that the Rochelais were reduced to the leather of their shoes. Supposing that after having eaten the leather they eat the soles, I cannot see much that is left unless they eat one another. Poor fools, said Athos, emptying a glass of excellent Bordeaux wine, which, without having at that period the reputation it now enjoys, merited it no less. Poor fools! as if the Catholic religion was not the most advantageous and the most agreeable of all religions. All the same, resumed he, after having clicked his tongue against his palate, they are brave fellows. But what the devil are you about, Aramis? continued Athos. Why, you are squeezing that letter into your pocket. Yes, said D'Artagnan, Athos is right, it must be burned. And yet, if we burn it, who knows whether Monsieur Cardinal has not a secret to interrogate ashes? He must have one, said Athos. What will you do with the letter, then? asked Porthos. Come here, Grimaud, said Athos. Grimaud rose and obeyed. As a punishment for having spoken without permission, my friend, you will please to eat this piece of paper. Then to recompense you for the service you will have rendered us, you shall afterward drink this glass of wine. First. Here is the letter. Eat heartily." Grimaud smiled, and with his eyes fixed upon the glass which Athos held in his hand, he ground the paper well between his teeth, and then swallowed it. "'Bravo, Monsieur Grimaud,' said Athos. "'And now take this. That's well. We dispense with your saying grace.' Grimaud silently swallowed the glass of Bordeaux wine, but his eyes, raised toward heaven during this delicious occupation, spoke a language which, though mute, was not the less expressive. "'And now,' said Athos, "'unless Monsieur Cardinal should form the ingenious idea of ripping up Grimaud, I think we may be pretty much at our ease respecting the letter.' 
Meantime, his eminence continued his melancholy ride, murmuring between his mustaches, These four men must positively be mine. End Chapter 51This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read and recorded by Catherine Eastman, www.stanford.edu slash tilde seastman. The Three Musketeers by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 52. Captivity. THE FIRST DAY Let us return to Milady, whom a glance thrown upon the coast of France has made us lose sight of for an instant. We shall find her still in the despairing attitude in which we left her, plunged in an abyss of dismal reflection, a dark hell at the gate of which she has almost left hope behind, because, for the first time, she doubts. For the first time, she fears. On two occasions, her fortune has failed her. On two occasions, she has found herself discovered and betrayed. And on these two occasions, it was to one fatal genius, sent doubtlessly by the Lord to combat her, that she has succumbed. D'Artagnan has conquered her, her, that invincible power of evil. He has deceived her in her love, humbled her in her pride, thwarted her in her ambition, and now he ruins her fortune, deprives her of liberty, and even threatens her life. Still more, he has lifted the corner of her mask, that shield with which she covered herself, and which rendered her so strong. D'Artagnan has turned aside from Buckingham, whom she hates as she hates every one she has loved, the tempest with which Richelieu threatened him in the person of the queen. D'Artagnan had passed himself upon her as de Ward, for whom she had conceived one of those tiger-like fancies common to women of her character. D'Artagnan knows that terrible secret which she has sworn no one shall know without dying. In short, at the moment in which she has just obtained from Richelieu a carte blanche, by the means of which she is about to take vengeance on her enemy, this precious paper is torn from her hands, and it is D'Artagnan who holds her prisoner, and is about to send her to some filthy botany bay, some infamous tibern of the Indian Ocean. All this she owes to D'Artagnan without doubt. From whom can come so many disgraces heaped upon her head, if not from him? He alone could have transmitted to Lord de Winter all these frightful secrets which he has discovered one after another by a train of fatalities. He knows her brother-in-law. He must have written to him. What hatred she distills! Motionless, with her burning and fixed glances, in her solitary apartment. How well the outbursts of passion, which at times escape from the depths of her chest with her respiration, accompany the sound of the surf, which rises, growls, roars, and breaks itself like an eternal and powerless despair, against the rocks on which is built this dark and lofty castle. How many magnificent projects of vengeance she conceives by the light of the flashes which her tempestuous passion casts over her mind, against Madame Bonacieux, against Buckingham, but above all against D'Artagnan, projects lost in the distance of the future. Yes, but in order to avenge herself, she must be free. And to be free, a prisoner has to pierce a wall, detach bars, cut through a floor. 
all undertakings which a patient and strong man may accomplish, but before which the feverish irritations of a woman must give way. Besides, to do all this, time is necessary, months, years. And she has ten or twelve days, as Lord de Winter, her fraternal and terrible jailer, has told her. And yet, if she were a man, she would attempt all this, and perhaps might succeed. Why, then, did heaven make the mistake of placing that man-like soul in that frail and delicate body? The first moments of her captivity were terrible. A few convulsions of rage, which she could not suppress, paid her debt of feminine weakness to nature. But, by degrees, she overcame the outbursts of her mad passion, and nervous tremblings which agitated her frame disappeared, and she remained folded within herself, like a fatigued serpent in repose. Go to, go to! I must have been mad to allow myself to be carried away so, says she, gazing into the glass, which reflects back to her eyes the burning glance by which she appears to interrogate herself. No violence. Violence is the proof of weakness. In the first place, I have never succeeded by that means. Perhaps if I employed my strength against women, I might perchance find them weaker than myself, and consequently conquer them, but it is with men that I struggle, and I am but a woman to them. Let me fight like a woman, then. My strength is in my weakness. Then, as if to render an account to herself of the changes she could place upon her countenance, so mobile and so expressive, she made it take all expressions, from that of passionate anger which convulsed her features, to that of the most sweet, most affectionate, and most seducing smile. Then her hair assumed successively, under her skilful hands, all the undulations she thought might assist the charms of her face. At length she murmured, satisfied with herself, "'Come, nothing is lost. I am still beautiful.' It was then nearly eight o'clock in the evening, Milady perceived a bed. She calculated that the repose of a few hours would not only refresh her head and her ideas, but still further her complexion. A better idea, however, came into her mind before going to bed. She had heard something said about supper. She had already been an hour in this apartment. They could not long delay bringing her a repast. The prisoner did not wish to lose time, and she resolved to make that very evening some attempts to ascertain the nature of the ground she had to work upon, by studying the characters of the men to whose guardianship she was committed. A light appeared under the door. This light announced the reappearance of her jailers. Milady, who had arisen, threw herself quickly into the armchair, her head thrown back, her beautiful hair unbound and disheveled, her bosom half bare beneath her crumpled lace, one hand on her heart and the other hanging down. The bolts were drawn, the door groaned upon its hinges, steps sounded in the chamber and drew near. "'Place that table there,' said a voice which the prisoner recognized as that of Felton. The order was executed. "'You will bring lights and relieve the sentinel,' continued Felton. And this double order which the young lieutenant gave to the same individuals proved to Milady that her servants were the same men as her guards, that is to say, soldiers. Felton's orders were, for the rest, executed with a silent rapidity that gave a good idea of the way in which he maintained discipline. At length, Felton, who had not yet looked at Milady, turned toward her. "'Ah, ah!' said he. "'She is asleep. That's well. When she wakes, she can sup.' And he made some steps toward the door. 
"'But my lieutenant,' said a soldier, less stoical than his chief, and who had approached Milady, "'this woman is not asleep.' "'What? Not asleep?' said Felton. "'What is she doing, then?' "'She has fainted. Her face is very pale, and I have listened in vain. I do not hear her breathe.' "'You are right,' said Felton, after having looked at Milady from the spot on which he stood, without moving a step toward her. "'Go and tell Lord de Winter that his prisoner has fainted. For this event not having been foreseen, I don't know what to do.' The soldier went out to obey the orders of his officer. Felton sat down upon an armchair which happened to be near the door, and waited without speaking a word without making a gesture. Milady possessed that great art, so much studied by women, of looking through her long eyelashes without appearing to open the lids. She perceived Felton, who sat with his back toward her. She continued to look at him for nearly ten minutes, and in these ten minutes the immovable guardian never turned round once. She then thought that Lord de Winter would come, and by his presence give fresh strength to her jailer. Her first trial was lost. She acted like a woman who reckons up her resources. As a result, she raised her head, opened her eyes, and sighed deeply. At this sigh, Felton turned round. "'Ah, you are awake, madam,' he said. "'Then I have nothing more to do here. If you want anything, you can ring.' "'Oh, my God, my God, how I have suffered!' said Milady, in that harmonious voice, which, like that of the ancient enchantresses, charmed all whom she wished to destroy. And she assumed, upon sitting up in the armchair, a still more graceful and abandoned position than when she reclined. Felton arose. "'You will be served thus, madame, three times a day,' said he. "'In the morning at nine o'clock, in the day at one o'clock, and in the evening at eight. "'If that does not suit you, you can point out what other hours you prefer, "'and in this respect your wishes will be complied with.' "'But am I to remain always alone in this vast and dismal chamber?' asked Milady. A woman of the neighborhood has been sent for, who will be to-morrow at the castle, and will return as often as you desire her presence. "'I thank you, sir,' replied the prisoner humbly. Felton made a slight bow, and directed his steps toward the door. At the moment he was about to go out, Lord de Winter appeared in the corridor, followed by the soldier who had been sent to inform him of the swoon of Milady. He held a vial of salts in his hand. "'Well, what is it? What is going on here?' said he, in a jeering voice, on seeing the prisoner sitting up, and Felton about to go out. "'Is this corpse come to life already?' "'Felton, my lad, did you not perceive that you were taken for a novice, "'and that the first act was being performed of a comedy "'of which we shall doubtless have the pleasure of following out all the developments?' "'I thought so, my lord,' said Felton. "'But as the prisoner is a woman, after all, "'I wish to pay her the attention that every man of gentle birth owes to a woman.' if not on her account, at least on my own. Milady shuddered through her whole system. These words of Felton's passed like ice through her veins. So, replied de Winter, laughing, that beautiful hair so skillfully disheveled, that white skin, and that languishing look have not yet seduced you, you heart of stone? No, my lord replied the impassive young man. Your lordship may be assured that it requires more than the tricks and coquetry of a woman to corrupt me. In that case, my brave lieutenant, let us leave Milady to find out something else and go to supper. But be easy. 
she has a fruitful imagination and the second act of the comedy will not delay its steps after the first and at these words lord de winter passed his arm through that of felton and led him out laughing oh i will be a match for you murmured milady between her teeth be assured of that you poor spoiled monk you poor converted soldier who has cut his uniform out of a monk's frock by the way resumed de winter stopping at the threshold of the door you must not milady let this check take away your appetite taste that fowl and those fish on my honour they are not poisoned i have a very good cook and he is not to be my heir i have full and perfect confidence in him do as i do adieu dear sister till your next swoon this was all that milady could endure her hands clutched her armchair she ground her teeth inwardly her eyes followed the motion of the door as it closed behind lord de winter and felton and the moment she was alone a fresh fit of despair seized her she cast her eyes upon the table saw the glittering of a knife rushed toward it and clutched it but her disappointment was cruel the blade was round and of flexible silver a burst of laughter resounded from the other side of the ill-closed door and the door reopened ha ha cried lord de winter ha ha don't you see my brave felton don't you see what i told you that knife was for you my lad she would have killed you observe this is one of her peculiarities to get rid thus after one fashion or another of all the people who bother her if i had listened to you the knife would have been pointed and of steel then no more of felton she would have cut your throat and after that everybody else's <laughs> see john see how well she knows how to handle a knife in fact milady still held the harmless weapon in her clenched hand but these last words this supreme insult relaxed her hands her strength and even her will the knife fell to the ground you were right my lord said felton with a tone of profound disgust which sounded to the very bottom of the heart of milady you were right my lord and i was wrong and both again left the room but this time milady lent a more attentive ear than the first and she heard their steps die away in the distance of the corridor i am lost murmured she i am lost i am in the power of men upon whom i can have no more influence than upon statues of bronze or granite they know me by heart and are steeled against all my weapons it is however impossible that this should end as they have decreed in fact as this last reflection indicated this instinctive return to hope sentiments of weakness or fear did not dwell long in her ardent spirit milady sat down to table ate from several dishes drank a little spanish wine and felt all her resolution return before she went to bed she had pondered analyzed turned on all sides examined on all points the words the steps the gestures the signs and even the silence of her interlocutors and of this profound skilful and anxious study the result was that felton everything considered appeared the more vulnerable of her two persecutors one expression above all recurred to the mind of the prisoner if i had listened to you lord de winter had said to felton felton then had spoken in her favour 
since Lord de Winter had not been willing to listen to him. "'Weak or strong,' repeated Milady, "'that man has, then, a spark of pity in his soul. "'Of that spark I will make a flame that shall devour him. "'As to the other, he knows me, he fears me, "'and knows what he has to expect of me "'if ever I escape from his hands. "'It is useless, then, to attempt anything with him. "'But Felton, that's another thing.' He is a young, ingenuous, pure man, who seems virtuous. Him there are means of destroying. And Milady went to bed, and fell asleep with a smile upon her lips. Any one who had seen her sleeping might have said she was a young girl dreaming of the crown of flowers she was to wear on her brow at the next festival. End of chapter 52 of The Three Musketeers Recorded on February 25th, 2006 by Catherine Eastman This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read and recorded by Catherine Eastman, www.stanford.edu, slash tilde, Seastman, on March 17, 2006. The Three Musketeers by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 53. Captivity. The Second Day. Milady dreamed that she at length had D'Artagnan in her power, that she was present at his execution, and it was the sight of his odious blood flowing beneath the axe of the headsman which spread that charming smile upon her lips. She slept as a prisoner sleeps, rocked by his first hope, in the morning, when they entered her chamber, she was still in bed. Felton remained in the corridor. He brought with him the woman of whom he had spoken the evening before, and who had just arrived. This woman entered, and, approaching Milady's bed, offered her services. Milady was habitually pale. Her complexion might, therefore, deceive a person who saw her for the first time. "'I am in a fever,' said she. "'I have not slept a single instant during all this long night. I suffer horribly. Are you likely to be more humane to me than others were yesterday? All I ask is permission to remain abed.' "'Would you like to have a physician called?' said the woman. Felton listened to this dialogue without speaking a word. Milady reflected that the more people she had around her, the more she would have to work upon, and Lord de Winter would redouble his watch. Besides, the physician might declare the ailment feigned, and Milady after having lost the first trick, was not willing to lose the second. "'Go and fetch a physician,' said she. "'What could be the good of that? These gentlemen declared yesterday that my illness was a comedy. It would be just the same today, no doubt, for since yesterday evening they have had plenty of time to send for a doctor.' "'Then?' said Felton, who became impatient. "'Say yourself, madame, what treatment you wish followed.' "'Eh, how can I tell? My God! I know that I suffer, that's all. Give me anything you like. It is of little consequence.' "'Go and fetch Lord de Winter,' said Felton, tired of these eternal complaints. "'Oh, no, no!' cried Milady, 
"'No, sir, do not call him. I conjure you. I am well. I want nothing. Do not call him.' She gave so much vehemence, such magnetic eloquence to this exclamation, that Felton, in spite of himself, advanced some steps into the room. "'He has come,' thought Milady. "'Meanwhile, madame, if you really suffer,' said Felton, "'a physician shall be sent for, and if you deceive us, well, it will be the worse for you. But at least we shall not have to reproach ourselves with anything.' Milady made no reply, but, turning her beautiful head round upon her pillow, she burst into tears and uttered heart-breaking sobs. Felton surveyed her for an instant with his usual impassiveness. Then, seeing that the crisis threatened to be prolonged, he went out. The woman followed him, and Lord de Winter did not appear. "'I fancy I begin to see my way,' murmured Milady, with a savage joy, burying herself under the clothes to conceal from anybody who might be watching her this burst of inward satisfaction. Two hours passed away. "'Now it is time that the malady should be over,' said she. "'Let me rise,' and obtain some success this very day. I have but ten days, and this evening two of them will be gone. In the morning, when they entered Milady's chamber, they had brought her breakfast. Now she thought they could not long delay coming to clear the table, and that Felton would then reappear. Milady was not deceived. Felton reappeared, and, without observing whether Milady had or had not touched her repast, made a sign that the table should be carried out of the room, it having been brought in ready spread. Felton remained behind. He held a book in his hand. Milady, reclining in an armchair near the chimney, beautiful, pale, and resigned, looked like a holy virgin awaiting martyrdom. Felton approached her and said, Lord de Winter, who is a Catholic like yourself, madame, thinking that the deprivation of the rites and ceremonies of your church might be painful to you, has consented that you should read every day the ordinary of your mass. And here is a book which contains the ritual. At the manner in which Felton laid the book upon the little table near which Milady was sitting, at the tone in which he pronounced the two words, Your Mass, at the disdainful smile with which he accompanied them, Milady raised her head and looked more attentively at the officer. By that plain arrangement of the hair, by that costume of extreme simplicity, by the brow, polished like marble, and as hard and impenetrable, she recognized one of those gloomy Puritans she had so often met, not only in the court of King James, but in that of the King of France, where, in spite of the remembrance of the Saint Bartholomew, they sometimes came to seek refuge. She then had one of those sudden inspirations which only people of genius receive in great crises, in supreme moments which are to decide their fortunes or their lives. Those two words, your mass, and a simple glance cast upon Felton, revealed to her all the importance of the reply she was about to make. But with that rapidity of intelligence which was peculiar to her, this reply, ready arranged, presented itself to her lips. I, said she, with an accent of disdain in unison with that which she had remarked in the voice of the young officer, I, sir, my mass? 
Lord de Winter, the corrupted Catholic, knows very well that I am not of his religion, and this is a snare he wishes to lay for me. And of what religion are you, then, madame? asked Felton, with an astonishment which, in spite of the empire he held over himself, he could not entirely conceal. I will tell it, cried Milady, with a feigned exultation, on the day when I shall have suffered sufficiently for my faith. The look of Felton revealed to Milady the full extent of the space she had opened for herself by this single word. The young officer, however, remained mute and motionless. His look alone had spoken. I am in the hands of my enemies, continued she, with that tone of enthusiasm which she knew was familiar to the Puritans. Well, let my God save me, or let me perish for my God. That is the reply I beg you to make to Lord de Winter. And as to this book, added she, pointing to the manual with her finger, but without touching it, as if she must be contaminated by it. You may carry it back and make use of it yourself, for doubtless you are doubly the accomplice of Lord de Winter, the accomplice in his persecutions, the accomplice in his heresies. Felton made no reply, took the book with the same appearance of repugnance which he had before manifested, and retired pensively. Lord de Winter came toward five o'clock in the evening. Milady had had time, during the whole day, to trace her plan of conduct. She received him like a woman who had already recovered all her advantages. "'It appears,' said the baron, seating himself in the armchair opposite that occupied by Milady, and stretching out his legs carelessly upon the hearth, it appears we have made a little apostasy. What do you mean, sir? I mean to say that since we last met, you have changed your religion. You have not by chance married a Protestant for a third husband, have you? Explain yourself, my lord, replied the prisoner with majesty, for though I hear your words, I declare I do not understand them. "'Then you have no religion at all. I like that best,' replied Lord de Winter, laughing. "'Certainly that is most in accord with your own principles,' replied Milady frigidly. "'Oh, I confess it is all the same to me.' "'Oh, you need not avow this religious indifference, my lord. Your debaucheries and crimes would vouch for it.' What? You talk of debaucheries, Madame Messalina, Lady Macbeth. Either I misunderstand you, or you are very shameless. You only speak thus because you are overheard, coolly replied Milady, and you wish to interest your jailers and your hangmen against me. My jailers and my hangmen? Heyday, madame, you are taking a poetical tone, and the comedy of yesterday turns to a tragedy this evening. As to the rest, in eight days you will be where you ought to be, and my task will be completed. Infamous task, impious task, cried Milady, with the exultation of a victim who provokes his judge. "'My word!' said de Winter, rising. "'I think the hussy is going mad. "'Come, come, calm yourself, Madame Puritan, "'or I'll remove you to a dungeon. "'It's my Spanish wine that has got into your head, is it not? "'But never mind. "'That sort of intoxication is not dangerous "'and will have no bad effects. "'And... Lord de Winter retired, swearing, which at that period was a very knightly habit. Felton was indeed behind the door, and had not lost one word of this scene. Milady had guessed aright. 
"'Yes, go, go,' said she to her brother. "'The effects are drawing near on the contrary. "'But you, weak fool, will not see them until it is too late to shun them.' Silence was re-established. Two hours passed away. Milady's supper was brought in, and she was found deeply engaged in saying her prayers aloud, prayers which she had learned of an old servant of her second husband, a most austere Puritan. She appeared to be in ecstasy, and did not pay the least attention to what was going on around her. Felton made a sign that she should not be disturbed, and when all was arranged, he went out quietly with the soldiers. Milady knew she might be watched, so she continued her prayers to the end, and it appeared to her that the soldier who was on duty at her door did not march with the same step, and seemed to listen. For the moment she wished nothing better. She arose, came to the table, ate but little, and drank only water. An hour after, her table was cleared, but Milady remarked that this time Felton did not accompany the soldiers. He feared, then, to see her too often. She turned toward the wall to smile, for there was in this smile such an expression of triumph that this smile alone would have betrayed her. She allowed, therefore, half an hour to pass away, and, as at that moment all was silence in the old castle, as nothing was heard but the eternal murmur of the waves, that immense breaking of the ocean, with her pure, harmonious, and powerful voice, she began the first couplet of the psalm then in great favor with the Puritans. Thou leavest thy servants, Lord, to see if they be strong. But soon thou dost afford thy hand to lead them on. These verses were not excellent very far from it, but, as it is well known, the Puritans did not pique themselves upon their poetry. While singing, Milady listened. The soldier on guard at her door stopped, as if he had been changed into stone. Milady was then able to judge of the effect she had produced. Then she continued her singing with inexpressible fervor and feeling. It appeared to her that the sounds spread to a distance beneath the vaulted roofs, and carried with them a magic charm to soften the hearts of her jailers. It, however, likewise appeared that the soldier on duty, a zealous Catholic, no doubt, shook off the charm, for through the door he called, "'Hold your tongue, madame! Your song is as dismal as a de profundis, and if besides the pleasure of being in garrison here we must hear such things as these, no mortal can hold out.' "'Silence!' then exclaimed another stern voice, which Milady recognized as that of Felton. "'What are you meddling with, stupid?' Did anybody order you to prevent that woman from singing? No. You were told to guard her, to fire at her if she attempted to fly. Guard her. If she flies, kill her. But don't exceed your orders. An expression of unspeakable joy lightened the countenance of Milady but this expression was fleeting as the reflection of lightning. Without appearing to have heard the dialogue, of which she had not lost a word, she began again, giving to her voice all the charm, all the power, all the seduction the demon had bestowed upon it. 
for all my tears my cares my exile and my chains i have my youth my prayers and god who counts my pains her voice of immense power and sublime expression gave to the rude unpolished poetry of these psalms a magic and an effect which the most exalted puritans rarely found in the songs of their brethren and which they were forced to ornament with all the resources of their imagination felton believed he heard the singing of the angel who consoled the three hebrews in the furnace milady continued one day our doors will ope with god come our desire and if betrays that hope to death we can aspire this verse into which the terrible enchantress threw her whole soul completed the trouble which had seized the heart of the young officer he opened the door quickly and milady saw him appear pale as usual but with his eye inflamed and almost wild why do you sing thus and with such a voice said he your pardon sir said milady with mildness i forgot that my songs are out of place in this castle i have perhaps offended you in your creed but it was without wishing to do so i swear pardon me then a fault which is perhaps great but which certainly was involuntary milady was so beautiful at this moment the religious ecstasy in which she appeared to be plunged gave such an expression to her countenance that felton was so dazzled that he fancied he beheld the angel whom he had only just before heard yes yes said he you disturb you agitate the people who live in the castle the poor senseless young man was not aware of the incoherence of his words while milady was reading with her lynx's eyes the very depths of his heart i will be silent then said milady casting down her eyes with all the sweetness she could give to her voice with all the resignation she could impress upon her manner no no madame said felton only do not sing so loud particularly at night and at these words felton feeling that he could not long maintain his severity toward his prisoner rushed out of the room you have done right lieutenant said the soldier such songs disturb the mind and yet we become accustomed to them her voice is so beautiful end of chapter fifty three of the three musketeers librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recorded by kevin Kivico. The Three Musketeers by Alexander Dumas. Chapter fifty four. Captivity. The Third Day. Felton had fallen, but there was still another step to be taken. He must be retained, or rather, he must be left quite alone, and Milady but obscurely perceived the means which could lead to this result still more must be done he must be made to speak in order that he might be spoken to for milady very well knew that her greatest seduction was in her voice 
which so skillfully ran over the whole gamut of tones from human speech to language celestial yet in spite of all this seduction milady might fail for felton was forewarned and that against the least chance from that moment she watched all his actions all his words from the simplest glance of his eyes to his gestures even to a breath that could be interpreted as a sigh in short she studied everything as a skilful comedian does to whom a new part has been assigned in a line to which he is not accustomed face to face with lord de winter her plan of conduct was more easy she had laid that down the preceding evening to remain silent and dignified in his presence from time to time to irritate him by affected disdain by a contemptuous word to provoke him to threats and violence which would produce a contrast with her own resignation such was her plan felton would see all perhaps he would say nothing but he would see in the morning felton came as usual but milady allowed him to preside over all the preparations for breakfast without addressing a word to him at the moment when he was about to retire she was cheered with a ray of hope for she thought he was about to speak but his lips moved without any sound leaving his mouth and making a powerful effort to control himself he sent back to his heart the words that were about to escape from his lips and went out toward midday lord de winter entered it was a tolerably fine winter's day and a ray of that pale english sun which lights but does not warm came through the bars of her prison Milady was looking out at the window and pretended not to hear the door as it opened. Ah, ah, said Lord de Winter, after having played comedy, after having played tragedy, we are now playing melancholy? The prisoner made no reply. Yes, yes, continued Lord de Winter, I understand. You would like very well to be at liberty on that beach. You would like very well to be in a good ship dancing upon the waves of that emerald green sea you would like very well either on land or on the ocean to lay for me one of those nice little ambuscades that you are so skilful in planning patience patience in four days time the shore will be beneath your feet the sea will be open to you more open then will perhaps be agreeable to you, for in four days England will be relieved of you. Milady folded her hands, and raising her fine eyes toward heaven, Lord, Lord, said she, with an angelic meekness of gesture and tone, pardon this man, as I myself pardon him. Yes, pray, accursed woman, cried the baron, your prayer is so much more generous from your being, I swear to you, in the power of a man who will never pardon you. And he went out. At the moment he went out, a piercing glance darted through the opening of the nearly closed door, and she perceived Felton, who drew quickly to one side to prevent being seen by her. Then she threw herself upon her knees and began to pray. My God! my god said she thou knowest in what holy cause i suffer give me then strength to suffer the door opened gently the beautiful supplicant pretended not to hear the noise and in a voice broken by tears she continued god of vengeance god of goodness wilt thou allow the frightful projects of this man to be accomplished then only she pretended to hear the sound of felton's steps and rising quick as thought she blushed as if ashamed of being surprised on her knees i do not like to disturb those who pray madame said felton seriously do not disturb yourself on my account i beseech you how do you know i was praying sir said milady in a voice broken by sobs you were deceived sir i was not praying do you think then madame replied felton in the same serious voice but with a milder tone do you think i assume the right of preventing a creature from prostrating herself before her creator god forbid besides repentance becomes the guilty whatever crimes they may have committed for me the guilty are sacred at the feet of god guilty i said milady with a smile which might have disarmed the angel of the last judgment guilty 
Oh, my God, thou knowest whether I am guilty. Say I am condemned, sir, if you please, but you know that God, who loves martyrs, sometimes permits the innocent to be condemned. Were you condemned? Were you innocent? Were you a martyr? replied Felton. The greater would be the necessity for prayer, and I myself would aid you with my prayers. Oh, you are a just man, cried Milady, throwing herself at his feet. I can hold out no longer, for I fear I shall be wanting in strength at the moment when I shall be forced to undergo the struggle and confess my faith. Listen, then, to the supplication of a despairing woman. You are abused, sir, but that is not the question. I only ask you one favor, and if you grant it me, I will bless you in this world and in the next. Speak to the master, madame, said Felton. Happily I am neither charged with the power of pardoning nor punishing. It is upon one higher place than I am that God has laid this responsibility. To you, no, to you alone, listen to me rather than add to my destruction, rather than add to my ignominy. If you have merited this shame, madame, if you have incurred this ignominy, you must submit to it as an offering to God. What do you say? Oh, you do not understand me when I speak of ignominy. You think I speak of some chastisement, of imprisonment or death. Would to heaven! Of what consequence to me is imprisonment or death? It is I who no longer understand you, madame, said Felton. Or rather, who pretend not to understand me, sir, replied the prisoner with a smile of incredulity. No, madame, on the honor of a soldier, on the faith of a Christian. What, are you ignorant of Lord de Winter's designs upon me? I am impossible you are his confidant i never lie madame oh he conceals them too little for you not to divine them i seek to divine nothing madame i wait until i am confided in and apart from that which lord de winter has said to me before you he has confided nothing to me why then cried milady with an incredible tone of truthfulness you are not his accomplice. You do not know that he destines me to a disgrace which all the punishments of the world cannot equal in horror. You are deceived, madame, said Felton, blushing. Lord de Winter is not capable of such a crime. Good, said Milady to herself. Without thinking what it is, he calls it a crime. Then aloud, the friend of that wretch is capable of everything. Whom do you call that wretch? asked Felton. Are there, then, in England two men to whom such an epithet can be applied? You mean George Villiers, asked Felton, whose looks became excited. Whom pagans and unbelieving Gentiles call Duke of Buckingham, replied Milady. I could not have thought that there was an Englishman in all England who would have required so long an explanation to make him understand of whom I was speaking. The hand of the Lord is stretched over him, said Felton. He will not escape the chastisement he deserves. Felton only expressed, with regard to the duke, the feeling of execration which all the English had declared toward him, whom the Catholics themselves called the extortioner, the pillager, the debauchee, and whom the Puritans styled simply Satan. "'Oh, my God, my God!' cried Milady. "'When I supplicate thee to pour upon this man the chastisement which is due, thou knowest it is not my own vengeance I pursue, but the deliverance of a whole nation that I implore.' do you know him then asked felton at length he interrogates me said milady to herself at the height of joy at having obtained so quickly such a great result oh know him yes yes to my misfortune to my eternal misfortune and milady twisted her arms as if in a paroxysm of grief felton no doubt felt within himself that his strength was abandoning him and he made several steps toward the door but the prisoner, whose eye never left him, sprang in pursuit of him and stopped him. Sir, cried she, be kind, be clement, listen to my prayer. That knife, which the fatal prudence of the baron deprived me of, because he knows the use I would make of it. Oh, hear me to the end. That knife, give it to me for a minute only, for mercy's, for pity's sake. I will embrace your knees. You shall shut the door that you may be certain I contemplate no injury to you. My God, to you, the only just, good, and compassionate being I have met with, to you, my preserver, perhaps, one minute that knife, one minute, a single minute, and I will restore it to you through the grating of the door. Only one minute, Mr. Felton, and you will have saved my honor. To kill yourself, cried Felton with terror, forgetting to withdraw his hands from the hands of the prisoner. 
to kill yourself i have told sir murmured milady lowering her voice and allowing herself to sink overpowered to the ground i have told my secret he knows all my god i am lost felton remained standing motionless and undecided he still doubts thought milady i have not been earnest enough some one was heard in the corridor milady recognized the step of lord de winter felton recognized it also and made a step toward the door milady sprang toward him oh not a word said she in a concentrated voice not a word of all that i have said to you to this man or i am lost and it would be you you then as the steps drew near she became silent for fear of being heard applying with a gesture of infinite terror her beautiful hand to felton's mouth felton gently repulsed milady and she sank into a chair lord de winter passed before the door without stopping and they heard the noise of his footsteps soon die away felton as pale as death remained some instants with his ear bent and listening then when the sound was quite extinct he breathed like a man awakening from a dream and rushed out of the apartment ah said milady listening in her turn to the noise of felton's steps which withdrew in a direction opposite to those of lord de winter at length you are mine then her brow darkened if he tells the baron said she i am lost for the baron who knows very well that i shall not kill myself will place me before him with a knife in my hand and he will discover that all this despair is but acted she placed herself before the glass and regarded herself attentively never had she appeared more beautiful oh yes said she smiling but we won't tell him in the evening lord de winter accompanied the supper sir said milady is your presence an indispensable accessory of my captivity could you not spare me the increase of torture which your visits cause me how dear sister said lord de winter did you not sentimentally inform me with that pretty mouth of yours so cruel to me to-day that you came to england solely for the pleasure of seeing me at your ease an enjoyment of which you told me you so sensibly felt the deprivation that you had risked everything for it seasickness tempest captivity well here i am be satisfied besides this time my visit has a motive milady trembled she thought felton had told all perhaps never in her life had this woman who had experienced so many opposite and powerful emotions felt her heart beat so violently she was seated lord de winter took a chair drew it toward her and sat down close beside her then taking a paper out of his pocket he unfolded it slowly here said he i want to show you the kind of passport which i have drawn up and which will serve you henceforward as the rule of order in the life i consent to leave you then turning his eyes from milady to the paper he read order to conduct the name is blank interrupted lord de winter if you have any preference you can point it out to me and if it be not within a thousand leagues of london attention will be paid to your wishes i will begin again then order to conduct to the person named charlotte baxon branded by the justice of the kingdom of france but liberated after chastisement she is to dwell in this place without ever going more than three leagues from it in case of any attempt to escape the penalty of death is to be applied she will receive five shillings per day for lodging and food that order does not concern me replied milady coldly since it bears another name than mine a name have you a name then i bear that of your brother ay but you are mistaken my brother is only your second husband and your first is still living tell me his name and i will put it in the place of the name of charlotte baxon no you will not you are silent well then you must be registered as charlotte baxon milady remained silent only this time it was no longer from affectation but from terror she believed the order ready for execution she thought that lord de winter had hastened her departure she thought she was condemned to set off that very evening everything in her mind was lost for an instant when all at once she perceived that no signature was attached to the order the joy she felt at this discovery was so great she could not conceal it yes yes said lord de winter who perceived what was passing in her mind yes you look for the signature and you say to yourself 
all is not lost for that order is not signed it is only shown to me to terrify me that's all you are mistaken to-morrow this order will be sent to the duke of buckingham the day after to-morrow it will return signed by his hand and marked with his seal and four and twenty hours afterward i will answer for it being carried into execution adieu madame that is all i had to say to you and i reply to you sir that this abuse of power this exile under a fictitious name are infamous would you like better to be hanged in your true name milady you know that the english laws are inexorable on the abuse of marriage speak freely although my name or rather that of my brother would be mixed up with the affair i will risk the scandal of a public trial to make myself certain of getting rid of you milady made no reply but became as pale as a corpse oh i see you prefer peregrination that's well madame and there is an old proverb that says traveling trains youth my faith you are not wrong after all and life is sweet that's the reason why i take such care you shall not deprive me of mine there only remains then the question of the five shillings to be settled you think me rather parsimonious don't you that's because i don't care to leave you the means of corrupting your jailers besides you will always have your charms left to seduce them employ them if your check with regard to felton has not disgusted you with attempts of that kind felton has not told him said milady to herself nothing is lost then and now madame till i see you again to-morrow i will come and announce to you the departure of my messenger lord de winter rose saluted her ironically and went out milady breathed again she had still four days before her four days would quite suffice to complete the seduction of felton a terrible idea however rushed into her mind she thought that lord de winter would perhaps send felton himself to get the order signed by the duke of buckingham in that case felton would escape her for in order to secure success the magic of a continuous seduction was necessary nevertheless as we have said one circumstance reassured her felton had not spoken as she would not appear to be agitated by the threats of lord de winter she placed herself at the table and ate then as she had done the evening before she fell on her knees and repeated her prayers aloud as on the evening before the soldier stopped his march to listen to her soon after she heard lighter steps than those of the sentinel which came from the end of the corridor and stopped before her door it is he said she and she began the same religious chant which had so strongly excited felton the evening before but although her voice sweet full and sonorous vibrated as harmoniously and as affectingly as ever the door remained shut it appeared however to milady that in one of the furtive glances she darted from time to time at the grating of the door she thought she saw the ardent eyes of the young man through the narrow opening but whether this was reality or vision he had this time sufficient self-command not to enter however a few instants after she had finished her religious song milady thought she heard a profound sigh then the same steps she had heard approach slowly withdrew as if with regret End of chapter fifty four